So this film happened. Ding! I strongly debated reviewing this at all, to be honest. Um, much like Transformers 3 or The Amazing Spider-Man 2, it just... People who will find it crap already know it's crap, and would be avoiding it anyway. Um, but unlike um, Transformers 3, actually not unlike Amazing Spider-Man 2, this is a good example of a film that is terrible overall, but has some good elements. I think this goes with a lot of Michael Bay's things, <laughs> which, by the way, you could argue if it's Michael Bay's thing or not with this one. It's It was written by three people and produced by five, so make your own conclusions about how much they really wanted to make this film based upon how many cooks were spoiling this broth. I mean, I mean let's start with the good, because everyone will have heard the bad already. Everyone will have heard... Well, they'll have heard it was Michael Bay, and basically there's a lot of explosions, not enough character development, and random scenes where cars are the most interesting thing on the screen. As is the Bay way. But there are some creative ideas that genuinely went into it. It's just that in execution, they weren't there, or were terrible. There's a constant running theme with the Foot Clan of mixing um, feudal Japanese uh, stuff and modern stuff. Uh, taking things like feudal Japanese masks and putting them on everything else that looks like just a normal terrorist cell. It just looks terrible and half assed but there was an idea there. The Shredder actually looks really cool. That worked. I'm impressed that that worked. Uh, his concept was fantastic. He was this big... He's essentially a Terminator, he looks like. And then you realise probably through, oh, he's basically a Transformer. I interesting, interesting there. But, because they don't execute things properly, we had this great Shredder design. But Shredder himself was very much a background character. He didn't seem to have a plan overall. Um, he was worried that the, the Foot Clan were vanishing into myth rather than being uh, seen and feared for what they actually are, even though they were definitely being seen and feared for what they are, because actually major news networks were talking about their cold on the city and how they were stomping on everything and just not caring, how they basically run the place and the police are powerless to stop them. They already had the power they wanted, they didn't need to do more. There's a problem with the other villain as well, I mean, I don't want to spoil things, but at the same time, he may as well have a giant goatee that he's twirling through every scene he's in because of how blatantly transparent he is when his eventual betrayal happens. He wants money. Oh look at that, one of them wants power, one of them wants money. How many times have we seen this effing team up? But the thing is, he already has money, lots of money. He has his own self-sustaining company and fancy business cards and labs and holding cells and all this technology and equipment and the, the just corner the market and so many things and it's like... How much more money do you want? And when he's explaining the, the money that he's going to get, he's like, I'll be rich, stupid rich. I'm like, yeah, stupid rich. You, what would you buy with this? You already have the money that you would need to buy whatever the F you want at all. What would getting more do for you? What is the point of this? You know, it's like Shredder gets more power if he wins. Yay. Except power is a loose concept in this, it's more that he gets more people to fear him, but people already fear him, except they fear the Foot Clan, they don't know who the hell he is. There's no point to him getting more power, he already has as much power as he would need to... I don't know what he needs to! I don't know what he wants, because he says what he wants, but he already has what he wants, so I don't know what the fuck he's even doing it for. The other problem with the villains is that the Shredder, uh... We don't see him in his suit at first, and then eventually he's revealed, and we know whether he's a Krang, or whether he's a human, or Japanese, or American, or what. Uh, we see him without his mask in his first scene. Immediately. He's kind of shadowy, but we can immediately see his face, some of the features, one scar, and it's really... You had this amazing masked man concept given to you, gift-wrapped, and you didn't even effing use it. There's no reveal with the Shredder whatsoever. Kurai is in this as well, um, but it's not even worth mentioning her. She's interchangeable with anything. She, there's no dynamic brought up to mention she's Shredder's daughter. There's nothing going on with her as a character. She's just the person who's shouting orders at the faceless terrorist cell for Clan, who seem to have no agenda whatsoever until the turtles turn up. They're doing something. I get that they're doing something. But there's this discussion once the turtles appear and Sax realizes this and is like, now we can execute that plan we had years ago. And I don't really know what the plan was before that. What their, their actual goal was. Were they just terrorizing people and fucking shit up? 
they were doing that, but I don't know why. It just seemed pointless. Everything before the turtle so shows up seems pointless. Before I get to the turtles, I'll think I'll finish up with talking about the other humans. April O'Neil is a fucking idiot. Um, there's no other way around it. I mean, every April has some kind of facet to them that makes them more useful or more identifiable or interesting than other humans in some way. Uh, in the TMNT animated series I grew up with, uh, she was incredibly adaptable and she was smart. She she had this legacy with her father and there's so many interesting things going on with her that it was interesting to watch her react to the turtles world and actually become a part of it and not be a damsel often, which is, which is good. Um, with the new TMNT series, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Nickelodeon series, which is good, and I will hardly recommend over this can of crap. Go watch that, it's awesome. Um, she is smart, uh, and she she's in, uh, she's a student, and she's really intelligent, and she gets mixed up in the whole turtle thing, but she's actually useful, and she does some work with Donatello, and they actually craft things together, and she goes to Splinter and is like, if I'm in danger, please teach me how to fight. And that's interesting. And she's really young in that series as well. She's actually the same age as the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, who act like teenagers, which is fantastic, because then it gives them this whole other dynamic. And she has a romantic thing going on with Donatello, which is believable and interesting and cute, uh, largely because Donnie's interested in her, but too shy and socially awkward, and because he's the smart one, uh, which works. Contrast to what we have here, April O'Neil is a journalist who is clearly working at his channel, working at channel 6, um, clearly doing very well for herself, doing that, um, but she keeps getting sent out on, well, we say keeps, we see one example of her getting sent out on something, and it's to cover an exercise program where she gets to jump up and down on the trampoline. And it's not even, like, a big impressive thing, it's like she's doing stupid bird movements and even being like, look, look at my boobs, look at my boobs. And I don't know why this happens. We never get to see who actually sends her out on things. We can see her go to the person in charge of the whole place, Wobby Goldberg, which means it definitely wasn't her sending her on sexist things because she's a woman herself, unless she just effing hates her. And we don't know why she would go to send on that, why she does the fluff stuff. She clearly doesn't want to, she hates it. She's trying to research other things all the time. But if, if she hates it so much, who's sending her there? We never see this, we never see why she's in the situation she's in at work. We just see that she is. And then when she's trying to get out of that situation by going steps further, it's only through saying she doesn't even have any tact. She goes straight to a Goldberg in front of other people in a meeting and talks about how there's a vigilante who can throw container crates, which is impossible. And uh, there's definitely no evidence of him, and there's one blurred photograph. Uh, and there's a photograph of the, um, the symbol he leaves behind. Then she researches it some more, she comes back to them, and, uh, to Whoopi, and in, privately this time, and, uh, as I think is in the trailers, or I think you can, if, uh, confirm, or it doesn't go well, um, but it's like, she show, she has no tactic at all, she shows her this giant board covered in this image, this, this stencil, and all the different foot things that have failed, and it's clearly, she's like, this is connected, this is this one person, it's the symbol for family, and there's not one of them, there's four of them, I saw them again, and this is interesting stuff that would make a story, and she has a photo of them all on her phone that she shows someone else. Instead, she shows a photo of a baby turtle, and she's like, they look like this, they look like this! Don't, they don't look anything like that because they're giant mutants. And Whoopi Goldberg already says they look like turtles. And she says, they don't look like turtles, they are turtles. Yeah, you look like a fucking nut job, okay? You are being an idiot with no t Say that they're in a costume. We have terror cell people with stupid Japanese feud with stupid masks going on, okay? Just lie or be inventive or make it into something that people would actually believe so you can get the word out there. Do something for your damn career other than shoot yourself in the foot over and over and over. What the fuck are you doing? I was about to say then there was the turtles but I totally forgot she has a sidekick who I can't remember the name of is not interesting and fulfills a trope of this film which I do not like in the slightest. Um, both he and Michelangelo have this trope which is it's okay to be a pervy slightly rapey asshole who only wants to have sex with someone and 
has never, ever had a positive sign from them and is inferring that there is consent when there definitely isn't. So long as you're funny, then it's fine. No! He's, he's frequently just staring at bits of her and asking her out or thinking that she's asking him out and she's not. She never gives him a hint that way, ever. And then Michelangelo is a step worse in that she pays him no attention whatsoever. She doesn't give a crap. She mainly talks to Leah because Leah's the only one who actually talks to her sociably. Um, he's the likeable one. They all have a trait. They always have a trait. Michelangelo's the funny one, except he isn't the funny one. This He's the annoying one. He's the one who makes too many 90s references. He's the one who just... He's a hornball. He's a teenage hornball. Um, and he just... The first time you see him, she's, he says that she's so hot, his shell is hardening. Or his shell's getting, shell's getting tight. It's like, I don't want to know about your fucking turtle erection. No. That's just weird. What age rating in this film again? Oh, I don't care. That's wrong for all age ratings. It's not funny. It's not interesting. It's just terrible. Raph is an asshole. Uh, frequently. At least that ties in with some of the traditions of his character, I guess. That he wants to go solo and hates everything. He has an arc, but by that I mean he hates everything until he stops hating everything and then breaks down and says that he loves his family. Big effing whoop. And it's just made way too dramatic. Donatello blows my mind. He's the embodiment of everything that's wrong with the turtle setup. Uh, they have salvaged equipment. They have things that, that have fallen into the sewers is, is an element which is unclearly something that's definitely happening. Like his glasses are clearly old, they're taped together in the middle. Um, but he has space age technology. He has a computer array with like 18 different screens. He has Oh, good God, there's, he has a hoverboard that he has from Mikey. He has analytical headgear. Right? And it, it, from everything that's on him, it's modern stuff because they have to place, place products. There's product placement literally everywhere. Everything he's using looks like it's based on an actual product. But everything he uses it for isn't. And it's... It, it's the kind of thing where if you can have this much high-tech stuff from the future, even though there's no sign of the Krang or space in this at all, so it seems pointless. I mean, there's one reference to space, but it, it clearly doesn't get anything out of it. Then, why haven't you got, like, laser eye surgery? Why haven't you gotten uh, better technology to help you fight anything? Why are you not armoured better? And, okay, Michelangelo and April. In the TV series, TV News, Donatello uh, having a crush on April is a crush. It's cute. It's put forward as a growth thing for him, trying to understand people. And he cares about her. He genuinely cares, and he will fight to protect her. Um, but also trusts her. And when she wants her own space, he gives her her own space. There's actually a relationship potentially there. And it works. Meanwhile, Mikey is not acting like a teenager. He's acting like late, late, late teens, maybe 20s university student who has seen a woman for the first time and just wants to fuck her. He's not interested in romance, he wants to fuck her. And it is weird. The reason it's weird is because these are not teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, they are, they look, they look like they're hulking monstrosities. Their faces are hideous. They look like they're and act for the majority of the film, except for the few times when they slip into acting like 12 year olds for some damn reason. They act like they're 30, they act like they're mature, they have responsibilities and things to do until they don't. And it's just keeps flip flopping between how old they should be. There's no consistency going on. And so, because he's so much older than her, clearly, and Megan Fox never looks like she's young, ever. That's another problem with the, her sidekick, is that when he's hitting on her, she, he is like over a head taller than her and looks so much older, like 10 years if not older. And I know I'm dating someone who's 9 years older than me, but we look like we could be dating. They do not. He looks like her dad. It is weird. And that's the problem with Michelangelo as well. He's, he looks too big. He looks like he would destroy her if he tried to bone her. And that's all he's interested in as well. There's no romantic element. He knows her so little. It's, it's creepy. I would not want to be left alone in a room with him. 
Uh, what else is there to talk about? So yeah, so it looks like they've foraged a lot of things because of stuff coupled together, and that's interesting. But at the same time, they have the most beautiful, pristine, perfect weaponry. Their weaponry is traditional and amazing, except for Donatello's, which for some reason extends as standard. He got it like that. It didn't. He didn't make it like that. And it's also, it, I I think it must be metal, even though it looks like wood, because he uses it to flip a car at one point. <laughs> It's nonsensical that they live in the sewers, uh, and they have these tattered masks, and he has little sellotaped glasses, and they just do what they can with what they have, and they have these gorgeous, pristine weaponry. If they had one weapon, and they treated it like it was the most expensive thing they could possibly own, and it was rare, and it might have been salvaged, or valuable, passed down maybe, that would make sense. But they don't. They have two katana. You know, it's an actually real katana in the normal shows. They have two sets of nunchucks. They have a giant bow staff and they have two sai. That's seven expensive pieces of weaponry. Alright? Not to mention all the screens and all the computers and all the phones and all... everything else. Wouldn't it be interesting then if Splinter came from uh, a family of wealth? If he had some kind of interesting backstory? No. All of them are genetic experiments raised by... April's father, and then set free into the sewers by April, uh, which is seen as an act of kindness, throwing them down a sewer drain. Wouldn't raising them by hand afterwards have been better? I don't understand this. Um, they have no backstory. I've heard two good ideas for how Splinter became a ninja and then taught them the rest of them. There was one which is that he was a pet rat, and he watched his master, and he imitated his master and he learned through that and then when he mutated and became a big human thing he kept practicing and he he learned through watching and through discipline and practice which is fantastic and then he taught his son to do the same uh and then there's the one in the current tv series which is an interesting twist which is that he wasn't a rat that mutated into a human he was a human that mutated into more, more rat like uh, and he was actually already, he's from Japan originally, and he was already skilled, he had a family, and he lost it all in this interesting backstory. Isn't that fascinating? Isn't that something you want to read more into? Well, you don't get that in this fucking shitty film. You get the fact that they have, no, that he found the art of ninjutsu as a book in the sewer. Not wet, fully formed, on the floor, found it around. And then he trained himself in the art of ninjutsu. It's like, oh, so you've learned all of this stuff from a book. That was really damn informative. So glad that you can read and speak Japanese and English throughout this film for no explainable reasons. And that while you're training with this book, despite there being no understanding as to how, you also have nunchucks and swords and ninja toe and all, all these things. Like, did... Did... A whole dojo just fall underground and get washed into the sewers. That would make so much sense of this. It would... I, why not put it in? You're meant to be a goofy, stupid action film. That's goofy and stupid. Throw it in there. An entire weapon shop and a dojo and DVD training manuals of how to do ninjutsu all fell into your friggin' lap and you just learned enough of that. Wouldn't that be convenient? Instead, it's stupid. And it makes no sense and it makes my head hurt. In the TV series, they make it work because they are stealing that stuff from the Krang, an alien race. They make that make sense. The reason that he has a centrifuge is because the Krang have a centrifuge and they steal the living Krang centrifuge. Hell yeah, go go Donatello being, you know, wumbling, essentially. The 90s references make some sense. I, I like the idea that they grew up, that they are teenagers, that they grew up uh, watching the world above them as they could from like the TV screens and shop windows and things like that and they've they've uh, they're products of that time so there's, there's references to that that's great except that what are they 14 then they're making 90s references and it's clearly 2014 because there's a giant sign with 2014 on it at some point just just to clarify this and ruin everything if it was set in the year 2000 then maybe they can make nice references that'd be fine but it's not it's 2014, so to make 90s references, they would have to be old enough to have remembered things from that time period. So they're like 24, if not older, like 30. They look like they're 30. They're not teenagers. I don't know why they left that in. Um, 
Mutant Ninja Turtles would be a much better title for this, or Mutant Brute Turtles, because they're not really ninja. They use ninja weapons, but they mainly use them to just stab and punch people repeatedly. Raph barely even uses his sigh at all. It's much more like Brute Force. And honestly, if you switch things up and make this a Brute Force film, that would actually be quite cool. The film knows what it wants to be, largely. It wants to be a goofy, over-the-top, stupid, fun action film. It's aiming at its teenage, late teenage, maybe like uni age or college age, uh, straight men with all the stuff that's going into it. There's explosions, there's cars, there's car chases and violence and more explosions and very paper thin plots from caricature villains and it's very followable but it's also so clearly rushing through anything that would be interesting so they can get this film over and done with, set up everything and make sequels out of it. Uh, you could tell within the first 10 minutes they want to make sequels out of it because the origin story we got the origin story. It went in the film. They discussed it. But we also got an animated origin story at the beginning, going through all of that anyway. It, why tell us the same thing twice? There is no point in this. It's a waste of time. I mean, if they wanted to start it out post that, and just start in Medias Res, that's fine. But but they didn't. They didn't, they didn't do anything like that. They just kept telling us over and over again how everything works. I mean, it's funny in part, and the actions are definitely there, though I don't feel particularly thrilled by any of them. There's no feeling that anyone's in danger, largely because nothing makes any sense. Uh, there's a scene when the foot storms the sewers and shoot tranquilizer darts so they can try and capture the turtles. Um, but there's a scene later when they full-on shoot them with bullets, and they discover they're bulletproof. The they ricochet off the shells, and if you shoot them in the front, they, they embed, and then you can flex them out and shoot people without having a gun. And... <laughs> Are you impenetrable or not? Make up your goddamn minds. Nothing makes any sense. There's a plot device that turns their blood into another chemical without any kind of synthesization or understanding of tech. It, it's just a magical plot device that makes things move forward faster. Um, that tower falling over thing from the trailers that they're using to rip off Spider-Man is actually right at the very end. It was a massive spoiler they put that in there at all. Um, but they don't seem to give a crap, so oh well. They placed over a hundred different products in this film. I feel like they're going for some kind of Guinness World Record. Uh, everyone uses the exact same phone and they constantly show off what the phone is. Uh, even, like, they... This is a phone that's based off taking brilliant photos. The whole point is that April can't take good photos, and that that's just embarrassing. The fact that this is this is in there as well. There's a phone where there's a moment where she takes would have taken a photo, but it says low light. I've never seen this, and it also had the exact image on the screen, meaning there wasn't low light. It was fine. If it had been a black screen, that would been that would have worked. There's a time later when she got a perfectly good photo, and the screen was black. They just weren't thinking anything through. I think two of the worst bits is when Splinter, who looks hideous by the way, the turtles are at least anthropomorphic and terrifying but interesting looking. He's just a rat standing up, but badly animated, and he looks grotesque and terrifying. Uh, and he, for the largest part of the film, he shows absolutely no love for his sons whatsoever. And that's... it's just sad to watch. But it's a bit early on where he catches them sneaking out and he takes them to the Hashim, uh, which I'm not sure what that Japanese is for. I'm guessing it's for Surrealist Terrifying Torture Chamber of Spooky Doom. Because what the fuck is even going on in that scene? They, they're they balancing on strange objects, but it doesn't look ninja -y at all except for the one that Mikey's doing. And they place a Pizza Hut pizza with a big Pizza Hut logo on in the middle. And he... It's, the scene's just spinning round and there's odd camera colours. And it's like a an LSD dream sequence. It's just weird. The whole thing is just... It's not rooted in reality. And it's fine not to be rooted in reality. This is science fiction in a way. This is stupid action, but it's so devoid of reality and humanness and anything logical that it becomes hard to follow or to care enough about to follow. The other thing is the the Shredder, fortunately, is at least kick-ass. He... you don't beat him in a fight. He beats you. Repeatedly. Which is great. Until... As with the previous failures of previous Turtles films, until you do have to beat Shredder, in which case nobody becomes suddenly easy. They make a terribly put-in reference 
to something earlier in the film, they do that, and it's like, ah, oh, and basically it just changed the tactics from let's attack him one at a time from a different angle to let's attack him one at a time from the same angle in an orderly queue. That'll win. And it does. If you're tempted by mutant brute turtles, honestly, I'd say go watch the TV series instead. The TV series is actually really good. The current one, Nickelodeon. Um, unlike Amazing Spider-Man 2, I found that this film just didn't have enough good moments. It had some moments that were funny, but they were just surrounded by so much filth I didn't even want to laugh. When Amazing Spider-Man 2 fucked up, it fucked up hard. When it did well, it did well really good, though. And overall, it was a terrible film. It was, it was shite. But... I'm glad I at least saw it, so I have my own opinions, and I got to see some of the really good bits, like Electro after he got transformed, slowly becoming a villain because of people reacting to him. That was good. The bits between Peter Parker and Gwen Stacy, where they're actually very romantic, they have really good chemistry together, they're funny, they're fantastic. That's really good. And then there's other elements, and they're bad individually. There's two, there's, it's clearly written by multiple people, and some of them are good, and some of them are bad. And you get a mixed bag, mostly bad. It's like a packet of Revels, where you've mostly got a flavour you don't like. You'll still eat the whole bag, because it's alright. It works. Um, Turtles, however, is more like someone giving you a bag of sugar and saying it's sherbet. It's just... There may be something in there, but you're not even sure, and you don't want to finish it. It wasn't fun. It was boring. It doesn't even feel like a thing. It feels like nothing. I'm mainly reviewing it just so I can point out that the TV series is out there, it's really good, and go watch that instead. Otherwise, that's the thing. Nickelodeon, if they don't get the ratings in on things, then they will tell things they're gonna close early. This is why Korra had such a difficult start and is finishing after series 4. Films that are out right now, or coming up, that I recommend you see, because they look like they're gonna be really good, and I'm looking forward to seeing them, but they might not make that much money because they don't look as appealing or marketed as, as Turtles. Uh, would be the new one by Laika, who made Coraline and Paranorman. It's called Box Trolls. It looks so creative and interesting and pretty, and I, I just I just want to see it so badly. They're showing it limited times, like once a week over here, and I just I just want to see it. I want to see it. It looks so good. Um, and The Book of Life, the new Guillermo del Toro film. Uh, it's about the Day of the Dead. It's a Halloween film that isn't scary. Appeal! Instant appeal! Uh, it's about love and the afterlife, and... Um, second chances, and it just, oh, it, and music, and oh, it looks so good. Uh, so there's two films that I have not seen, but I'll hardly recommend over this pile of crap. Uh, otherwise, yeah, TV series. Go. Cool.